Okay, so today we are going through like classifications. So basically oh. classification. Hold on, we're seeing your our studio window, so we don't really see the slides. Okay, sir. Um, you might have to reshare. Is it on now? There it goes, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll skip the learning objectives. So it's quite a wordy, I tried to cut it down. So what happened for this is, so classification is usually just an approach where you have a categorical response variable. So there are a few like classifiers that we can use for classifications, like those kind of modeling where you can use logistic regressions. Then we will talk a bit more about linear discriminant analysis, quadratic discriminant analysis, NABAPE and KNN. So there are a few like classification problems that I took from the book. So for this, the first scenario where you have like a patient arriving at the emergency room and the predictor usually comes more of like a list of symptoms that they might experience, he or she might experience. Then the response variable is like you trying to figure out what kind of medical conditions that the person has. Okay, then for the second scenario is where you try to figure out whether there's a fraudulent practices. So you look at those past previous IP addresses, their past transaction history, and you determine whether is there any fraudulent activities going on or not. I think the examples, the light alignment was a bit out. So then in this data, in the whole chapter, we're going to talk deeply about the default data sets. So in the default data sets, you have like two main predictors, which is the income and the balances, which is the monthly credit card balances that a person has in the bank. So then we will use that to predict whether an individual would default or not on his credit card payment. So if you look at the figure, so when we plot, we have these two predictors on the X and the Y axis where you have balance on the X and income on the Y, you can see there's a difference in between where people with higher balance actually are more likely to default on the payment, whereas those blue spots, blue circles, refers to people who do not default on their payment, where they have a lower balance. So if you look closely into the right, in the middle plot, you can see there's actually a difference. The median was like quite significantly different, whereas there's no difference for those that, um, for the income, where people who default and people who do not default, their, their income is about the same. So then the book talk about why we don't use linear regressions for certain situations. So linear regression doesn't work when you try to convert some qualitative like response variable. For example, let's say you have um, three kind of like illness where you have like stroke, epilep epilepsy or drug overdose. Then they'll think, what they mentioned was they talk about how the difference into, between like one and two is not equivalent to the difference between two and three, even though you did order them together. So it makes the interpretations when you run the analysis, it makes the interpretations harder because you wouldn't, by the way you change the order of the illness, then you will get different interpretation every time you run the regression analysis. Um, am I going too fast? Is that okay? Oh, the equation didn't run. Oh, it's going great. So, yeah, except for the rendering, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, thing, the math thing. So this chapter, a lot about like starting from 4.3 to 4.6 onwards, there was a lot like mathematical formulas. So first they go about logistic regressions where logistic regression is usually used for where you have a binary response variable. So either you belongs to like, and we code it as zero or one. So it looks into like certain formula. <laughs> so the first one, this is the one for linear regressions where you have a intercept and then you have a slope for, let's say X, only one predictor. 
Then we look, they go, when you go into logistic regression, you can get the odds means what's the probability of you on the likelihood of you being into that class. So then they have, what they did was they do, a, for the probability, they just do a lock for both sides and then they get a, a I don't see it clearly here. Then that's a, I remember how it was. Let me check, double check. <laughs> oh, so for the odds ratio, it was more of where you have the Euler kind of sign, then you put it to the power of the linear regression equations that usually we have over one plus the e to the power of the linear um, linear equation. Did it render yeah. okay in your, um, when you were running it in our studio? I wonder if we can, maybe it is worth rolling through the R studio version. Yeah, because here is a bit difficult to see. Like I couldn't even understand my own formula. Yeah, let's take a look and see if we can see what's up. Um, I'll just share this. So this one will be clear. That's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> this one is better, right? Okay. So the first one is where this is the first line where you have a linear regression. So this is what we are familiar with. But when you do a logistic function, means you lock both sides, you have this e to the power of this top part where is the log uh, linear regression equation over one plus e to the function of linear regression then what they actually want was the second and the third line is about the same where you have this odd ratio. So E, so what they're calling is this is the odds. And when you do a log of these odds, what you should arrive was this Px over one minus Px. And this is what we're going to use for most of the linear logistic regression. So usually for to estimate regression coefficient when there's a categorical response variable, you use a maximum likelihood. And so then that's a function of this likelihood function, which I don't really understand even though I try to understand it. <laughs> so you have this probability of x, which is about the same as 1 minus the probability of this x as well. So I still couldn't figure out this function. But as we move on to the multiple logistic regressions, so it's, for the multiple logistic regression is where you actually incorporate more of the x variables, then you have this log. So instead of just like two so what they're talking about in logistic regression, you can only have two binary response variables. But if you go on to a multiple logistic regressions, you can have at least more than two response variables. So it's still possible to do a multinomial logistic regressions. Then this, the Px, the probability is this maximum likelihood. This is the one that we try to estimate by using this formula, which is the e to the power of that regressions equation over one plus the whole linear regression equation. So the next one, they talk about how there's, let's say if there's a confounding Right, yeah. So let's say they talk, there's a confound, let's say there's a different default rate for when you are a student and when you are non students So the orange line refers to students and the blue line refers to non students And the black line at the bottom of this credit card balance, so that is the... Oh, sorry, the horizontal broken, like the dotted lines refers to the overall default rate. So the default rate is like slightly 
lower that as you see as the credit card balances increases the default rate actually increases as well but there's a slight difference between the students and non-students as but the difference is not really like significant if you look at the box plot where the student status on the x-axis you have although students have slightly higher credit card balance than non-students but the error is still about the same so it's not likely to be significant okay i'll go back to here so the next one is they talk about why logistic regressions is not really ideal so they say about when if let's say the two classes there's actually a significant difference then the parameter estimates for the logistic regressions model will usually be unstable then if you have a small sample size usually the generative modeling will be more accurate than logistic regression so generative modeling refers to those like linear discriminant those you're using classifier like linear discriminant analysis or quadratic discriminant analysis so and those generative modeling can be more likely to be extended to more than two response variables because usually logistic regressions we use it for let's say only two binary response variables then to estimate or to come up with classifiers there are a few common notation um, where this is the common we use Bayes theorem where you look at the probability of condition y this k is the classes so when y equals to k given that x given your predictor this pi over k like pi like is the prior probability so so usually that's how you get from uh, randomly chosen observations and you can obtain it from a random sample so let's say you have a population so you get a sample for it and you calculate what's the uh, probability of getting that class, the probability of the observation being in that K class. Then over this, here is the density. Then the other one was this FK, this FX. This FX is important. This refers to more of a density functions where let's say for every class, you have a different distribution. Then they look at what is the density for each of the observation in that class. And this one is a bit, this one is for different types of classifiers, you will have different assumptions that you need to make and there will be different ways to estimate this F thing. Then, so now let's look at the difference of the <laughs> comparisons model. So there's a difference in between the classification methods. So yeah. I just pulled it down and experimented real quick while you were talking. And so that's the the thing that's causing the error is a new line after the dollar dollar, just for future reference for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all the classifiers are actually using different estimates of this fx. So we will just focus on the three main one, which is the LDA, QDA, and naive Bayesian. So for first one, where you have linear discriminant analysis LDA, where you have one predictor, just one predictor. So this one will be similar to a very Oh, no, sorry. So this is where we wanted to look into how the Bain's theorem, where you have the observations where your probability is the greatest. 
So remember, we were talking about maximum likelihood. So you want the, the likelihood where it is the greatest. So for LDA, we always assume that we make a few assumptions. And while we, we assume that it's always a normal distribution, and you have this class specific mean, and you have a share variance across, means a common variance across all K classes. <laughs> then the usually the normal density, this is how they actually calculated. I feel like it's just good to put it there, but it's not really necessary to know how to run the formula. So this is how the normal density equation looks like. Then after that, we, they talk about how they want to get the posterior probability, where they use these similar equations where they actually put in this P into the prior equation, which is this one, the probability equations, where you just substitute this equation to the equation. Then, so, so then it's like more formulas where they talk about how they wanted to get the decision boundary. So let's say when you have like less than five, you split it, you have equal observation in each class. Then usually this one, which is, I believe is the change, which is change in K, right? Change in X is about the same. When it's about the same, they talk about how you can just take the mean of two different classes and just divide two. Then that's how they say if that's the variance is the same. So from the figure, you can actually see that. Uh, so the dashed line is actually the decision boundary. So right now is the one on the left and I think the one on the left and the right, they both have uh, equal observations from each classes. So for the one on the left is more of a normal density functions where you see there's an overlapping and the middle dash line is the decision boundary. Then for the one on the right, where you have 20 observations and we look at the histogram and you realize that the decision line is again shown as the dash line. So this both, like I think both comes from the training data. So, uh, Then the LDA method, right? So, so in theory, in real life, it's difficult to get the, remember the F, which is the probability. So what they're doing in linear discriminant analysis was just plotting the estimates for where you have this prior probability, then you have the mean for each class and you have the standard deviation for each class into the equation, which was the previous equation. And this, then you will arrive at this one. So what they wanted to do, this LDA classifications, so you assign the observations for where you wanted to get the largest value for this change in X. So linear discriminant analysis can also be used for where you have uh, multiple predictors and when your observations come from a multivariate distribution. So for how is it different is instead of the common variance, now you have a common covariance matrix. And some of the assumptions is even though your predictors having some correlations, you are still be able to use the linear discriminant analysis. 
So I think this figure is interesting as it, if the one, if you look on the one on the left, it has a circular base, whereas the one on the right has a more like elliptical kind of base. So for the one on the left, when you look at it, it this one refers to a normal distribution. So it means if you cut it halfway, the x1 predictors or versus cut it halfway at the, at, across the x2, you will always get the bell curve shape. Whereas for the one, the figure, the diagram on the right side, this one is usually what you see when you have a correlations between the predictors x1 and x2. So in this case, this one has a quite a high correlations of 0 0.7. That's why the base looks very like an ellipse. Then they next also still similarly talk about this sigma k where they have come up with a lot the equations to how to calculate the vector matrix. Then this is the figure where, let's say, the one on the left, so they have like three classes, and this one is comes from a multivariate distribution, and you have two predictors, like three classes and two predictors. So there's a class specific mean and there's also a common covariance matrices. So if you compare it to the left and the right, the left one, this one, it looks like ellipse because it contains, if it's ellipse, it means it contains about 90% of all the observations, like 95% of all the observations. And this dash line, uh, referring to the decision boundary. Then if you look on the right, there's actually just a slight deviation because usually for all those modeling that we try to run, there's always a test error rates. So the solid line refers to the actual, I believe is the actual decision boundaries, whereas the dash one is what they use for the LDA, like the what they calculated for the linear discriminant analysis one boundaries. So the conclusion is, is just very similar. So they, they are talking about when you use the base theorem or you use another formula to calculate the LDA classifier, the error rates is about the same because you can see the difference in the line. They are quite identical. Then, so all classification models will have this training error rate and we can actually display it with a confusion matrix. So confusion matrix is provided that you actually collected the data for a bigger sample size with higher end. But the problem is, let's say you have this um, when you try to calculate this error rate, you always get a training error rate that is lower than the test error rate, which is what we are really interested in. And when you also have, they talk about when you have a higher ratio of parameters to the number of sample at means the more parameters that you have, then the smaller the sample you have, then we expect that it always overfit. And then for all the binary classification, they can actually make two types of error where it's either you get a correct response or you get a wrong response, then there will be like type one and type two error. So then they talk about So they talk about it's important for you to look into the sensitivity and the specific 
specificity for each modeling. Uh, it, then it really depends on the view that you are in. So LDA has a very low sensitivity because LDA is always trying to estimate your base classifier. So it will try to like reduce the bias. But in the process, um, So in the process, I think it creates, I don't remember, was it? It was trying to create the lowest bias. Then in the process, it creates more variance. So it refers back to the second chapter where we talk about the bias and the variance trade-off. So if you look at this figure where the error rates, as the threshold increases, your error rate actually decreases. Okay, then this blue line refers to um, the default customers who default that they are incorrectly classified, whereas the orange line, where it's not obvious, it's like under the black line, it indicates the fraction of errors among those non-defaulting customers. So as you reduce the increase the threshold, your error rates decrease, but, uh, wait, am I saying right? So as your threshold is reduced, if you go to the left, the threshold is reduced, then the error rate among individuals who default, they decrease steadily, but the error rate among individuals who do not default increases, which is this one. The blue line. So whenever you make a decision on the threshold, you must always base it on your domain knowledge on the field. So for example, where we talk about the default data set, you could have set the decision boundaries to be 0.5, but then it's not sensitive enough, let's say for a bank to find customers who are likely to default on their credit cards. So you might want to like reduce your threshold to like let's say point, point 0.2 or point 0.1 just to be more sense to have increased the sensitivity of the test to find people who are more likely to default. So what we can do is, is to look into the two types of errors like the just now the previous the sensitivity and the specificity. You can use a ROC curve. So ROC curve looks into two, which is the false positive rate and the false, like the false positive rate and the true positive rate. So the ideal one is where you want to have a curve at the upper left corner. So there are, let's say for default, there are like four kind of scenarios. So let's say people who actually default, you manage to find, detect them, or you don't manage to detect them. Then let's say false positive rates refers to, uh, oh, sorry, the true positive rate is the sensitivity, the one on the y-axis. So this is the, proportion of like those people who default and you manage to correctly identify that. Then the false negative rate is one minus the specificity of one. Uh, so it means it's the fraction of people who do not default but and we classify them incorrectly as people who default. So an ideal one, as I mentioned earlier, the ROC curve is you want a high true positive rate and a low false positive rate. Then in the middle, you will see a diagonal line where this one refers to like no information classified. So this is what we will expect if the student status, let's say, 
other compounding like the student status and all the card balances are not associated with the probability of default. And they also mentioned if you, the ideal ROC is you want a larger area under the ROC curve, which, so when you have a larger area, then the classifier would be even better. So uh, this one is where I think this one was looking at whether it's still the default data set where you have the true class and the predicted class. So why is it uh so here is where I think the now hypothesis is something is missing here. Sorry. It should be a minus. Mm. So there's like four things whether you will get a true negative, like false negative, or false positive, or true positive. It was what I mentioned earlier. So you will have, most likely you will get, like if they really did not default, then you manage to detect them. But what we are interested in is the diagonal side where this false positive is when they are likely to default, but you didn't manage to detect them. Or when they do not default, but you detect them as uh, someone who are likely to default. So we are just interested in this diagonal section where it's like the false positive and the false negative. So again, this false positive rate is the, your specificity. And then you have this one minus type two error, like this true positive rate is actually your one minus the error, type two error or what we call usually as the power. So this is the sensitivity. Then we also have this uh, positive predicted value, which is this one. Means it refers to your, so how likely you are to predict it accurately and we define as a precision. So sometimes not all the modeling will require like linear, will have a linear relationship for X. So sometimes you can use where quadratic discriminant analysis and the assumptions are similar to the LDA one. So you still need a normal distributions. Then you still need to plug in your estimates of your mean and your estimates for your variance into the Bain's theorem to perform the prediction. Just that what's different for QDA is QDA assumes that every class has its own covariance matrix. So it's not a common covariance matrix. Mm. So this is how it looks like, means all the X is approximate to a normal distribution where you have a mu, and this is a covariance matrix for all the K class. K class means the response at Y. Then they have more formulas for Bayes classifications. Um, I'm not sure whether it's important to know about how to actually compute this part, the equations, but I just wrote it down. So it's the similar process where you actually have to still est to estimate your F. You still need to plug in estimates, means you need to calculate your covariance matrix, you need a mu, and you need the standard deviation into the equations. 
and we want to find where this uh, change in x where the quantity is the largest. So because this the way it's written, the quantity here appears like a quadratic function up to a power x to a power something. So hence we they call it a quadratic discriminant analysis. So a uh, difference between why LDA is preferred to QDA or maybe sometimes QDA is preferred to LDA. So it really depends on the bias variance trade off. So first of all, like LDA assumes that all the K class share a common covariance matrix. Then we assume that X is the quantity of X is linear. So when there's a linear relationship, then we usually would prefer the LDA. QDA is for when you have a non-linear one. And so and LDA is also less flexible. So it has like higher bias, I think. Higher bias, so it has a lower variance. So that it might improve a prediction. Uh, so if uh, then you need to look into if all your K classes, they actually share a common covariance matrix. Um, like they don't or they don't really share a common covariance matrix then LDA can actually suffer from high bias. Then the conclusion is you use LDA when there's actually a few training observations then you can use QDA when your training, your N is very large or when you have a co common covariance matrix that is untenable. Uh, the next figure is where you look at the base theorem, which is the purple dash line. Then you have the LDA, which is the black uh, straight line, the linear line here. Then QDA is when we use for when it's not linear, the green line. So this is a problem where we have two class, so zero or one. So the shading is where we have this, we define how we define our decision rules. So in the first one, you can see the Bain's, uh, Bain's decision boundary is linear. So when it's a linear one, you can see it's actually more appropriate to use LDA rather than the QDA. But then on the right, where you don't have a linear boundary, so it seems that the QDA will be a more appropriate classifier. Then they talk about naive base is sometimes you do logistic regression, LDA or QDA, then the fourth one will be the naive base. It's where you try to estimate the p-dimensional density function uh, is a bit challenging because all those complicated formula. So naive base, they actually use a different assumptions. So the main assumption is they do not assume the predictors are correlated. Means the predictors have are always independent. It's a much simplified explanation. So then they also, this is an alternative that we use to LDA where we don't see a normally distributed predictors. So we assume, we just assume they are independent and we use the base. So when we assume that the P like predictors, like every for each class, they are independent. So we can get a pretty well results when your n is small 
and when you have a large number of predictors. It also helps you to reduce your variance, even though it helps. It has increases some of the bias or introduce some of the bias into the modeling. Uh, so this part is, I wish it's better, but this one is important. I, I try to summarize it as much as possible. So when you look into, when you have a quantitative one, so to look into the one dimensional density function, you want to look into the quantitative X. So let's say you have a quantitative more a continuous one. Uh, then your predictor is drawn from a uh, normal distribution. Then we more like, it's better if you use a QDA. All the other option is when you have a quantitative X, okay, then you can use a histogram and or you use some and then just estimate your F or you can use a kernel density estimator. They didn't elaborate on this. I think it was just italicized in the book, like what it really does. Then if you have a qualitative X where you can just easily just count the proportions of training observations. So these three methods is how in nay base where you try to estimate your density function. Okay, I think I'll finish up to here. So when to use all this LDA logistic regression as QDA? So when you assume the odds of your posterior probabilities, which is your, the pi thing is linear, you should use LDA and logistic regressions because both assume linear. QDA is when your odds that you calculated, the probability is quadratic. So LDA is just a simple or more uh, restricted versions of QDA. And also we noted is LDA and naive base are quite similar. So LDA can be a special case of NAE base or NAE base can be a special case of LDA. It means that when you have a linear relationship, you should see the error rates for LDA logistic regressions and NAE base are, should be about the same if they are like linear and other assumptions are quite similar. So one thing is LDA always assumes that it's a normal distribution and you have a common covariance matrix. Whereas naive base assume the independence. So it means independence of the predictor. As such, because naive base assume independence, so naive base will be a more flexible fix. Then we will use QDA where you have a settings where your interactions are important, where you want to look into which predictors are more important. When the observation at each of the K class is normal, LDA will be better than logistic regressions. And when you don't have a linear decision boundary and you have a n, large n and a small p, you use a K nearest neighbor because K nearest neighbor, they will have a very low bias, but they will have a large variance. And to use K and N is best if you have a huge number of observations. But if your both your decision boundary is non-linear and your both N and P are small, because K and N requires a huge observation, a huge number of observation, then QDA would might be preferred than KNN. And besides KNN will not tell you which of the predictors are important. So final notes is whichever method you choose, look first, you think of the distribution, 
Then the second one, you want to look at your number of observations and number of predictors. Because number of observations, like number of observations, the N and the P, this one relates to the bias variance trade-off where sometimes you might get a low bias, but there'll be a higher variance. Should I go on with this one? I think let's go ahead and finish this slide and then we can wrap up. Hmm. Yeah, so I think this one is very easy to for you to compare different models. So for the first scenario, if you look at it, when you have a binary class response um, and you have equal observation in each class, let's say n in each class, same observations, and you have uncorrelated predictors. So because you will see the LDA and logistic regressions will perform similarly well, then naive base will be quite well as well because naive base is quite similar to the linear discriminant analysis. Then the QDA is still okay because they are, but for K and N, because they are uncorrelated, you will see the error rates is much higher. This one is missing, yeah. So then for scenario two, is quite a similar where your binary response equal, but this time your predictors, let's say your predictors has a correlation. So, and it has a negative correlations. When it still has a negative correlations, the LDA and logistic regression still about the same, but you will see naive base, suddenly the error rate shoots up higher because they base assume the independence of your predictors. Then the rest is about the same. But for scenario three, you have a negative correlations and then you have a key distribution where it means more extreme points at the tier. You will see the error rates for naive base when you have a different distribution. Naive base and the QDA actually increases the error rate actually increases a lot. So all these three, the first scenario one to three is where you have a linear based decision boundary. So when it's non-linear, you will see it affects all the LDA logistic regression and naive base. Because these three are the main one that assume a linear decision boundary. So for scenario four, you have a correlations of 0.5 between predictors in the first class, then a negative correlations between predictors in the second class. So this one, actually you will see QDA is the, actually the best one where you have co correlations in one class and another different correlations here because QDA does not assume a common matrix covariance matrix. So for scenario five, you still have a normal distribution, but this time the predictors are uncorrelated. So when your predictors are uncorrelated, what is best is the uh, naive base will be performed much better, but then here the best one is the KNN. So there's a difference between this KNN1 versus KNN-CV. So this one refers to the amount of smoothing. So even though they are both like KNN classifier, so it depends on the smooth, the spline, spline value that you selected. So some might be better. Then for six, where you have a different diagonal covariance matrix for all class and you have a very small N, you will see the error rates, name base is actually, when you have a small and name base is actually the best classifier. Yeah. So this 4.7 is more like how we can use generalized linear model. 
So general linear model is when Hold on. Let's stop. Have... Let's stop here. <laughs> Let's stop. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. We'll get those taken care of for the future, oh, no, hopefully. No, um, no, it's my bad. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I, 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 I gave you a review on the PR now. I didn't have a chance to look at it yesterday, but um, hopefully that'll help clear it up. And then next week, I can't remember. I know we have a volunteer. Is, does anyone know who our volunteer is for next week? Um, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, Kim. So uh, we'll get this one cleaned up so you can continue from the same notes. And um, we'll continue uh, where we left off today. Um, yeah. And I'll we'll clean see. Up the, I'll clean up the uh, uh, markdown document, then I'll just. Take a look at my review because I, I, I already did a lot of cleanup. So if you pull down my notes, it'll oh, okay. it'll help <laughs> for my improvement. Okay. Um, yeah, we might not finish next week. Um, I was trying to look real quick at at. I think we might actually. Um, there's not that much left, so we got most of the way through. Uh, so after that, it looks like Laura is going to start, hopefully chapter five, but it might be chapter four and we'll talk next week because we're getting into um holidays in the u.s that might interfere so we'll see um i think tuesday is probably early, early enough in the week that we'll just continue on but we'll talk about that next week so i'll see everyone then <laughs> bye okay. bye thanks